Good morning, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to speak to you. First thing I want to make very clear is, is in offering to make this presentation this morning, I am not the Oracle of Delphi on how to develop the access matrix. I agreed to come here this morning and share with you the trials and tribulations that our school board has gone through to this point to develop what I can show you this morning. But I fully understand that there'll be boards within here this morning who probably have a far more mature model of this that you can probably add more to the conversation than I can add at this point. So what I hope I'm doing this morning is kick-starting a dialogue about <coughs> developing the access matrix. If you're a board that really isn't very far out of the starting blocks yet, then hopefully you're going to get a lot more out of the presentation that's going to be made this morning. But I encourage you, please, along the way, to speak up and say, Garth, that's not a very good idea, or there's a better way to do it, or we've got this idea and that idea, and all that's welcome because I want to make it very clear, it's, this is just our attempt, first attempts, at developing an access matrix. I will share with you, and I think I'll get agreement very quickly, that developing the access matrix is a very thorny issue. And it is not an event, it's certainly a process. We've come to realize that developing the access matrix for our board will be a process that literally will go on forever. Hopefully we can get something in place and we'll continue to refine it and refine it and refine it. That being stated, if you would indulge me, there may be some in the room who are not even sure about what the access matrix is, and I thought I'd go right back to the starting point, which is the Privacy Information Management Toolkit. And the toolkit focuses in on the definition of what the access matrix is and how it should be implemented on pages 48 through 52. So if you would, I, I know how I feel when people read to me from PowerPoint slides, but indulge me a little bit because I think everyone needs to see what's on those pages. So that's what Sandra's got on the screen right now and directly out of the PIM toolkit. The purpose is, uh, the purpose of using the access matrix is to ensure that your school board or authority is complying with the following requirements of MFIPA. One, that every head shall ensure that reasonable measures to prevent unauthorized access to the records in his or her institution are defined, documented, and put in place, taking into account the nature of the records to be protected. Two, that every head shall ensure that only those individuals who need a record for the performance of their duties shall have access to it. Three, every head shall ensure that reasonable measures to protect the records in his or her institution from inadvertent destruction or damage are defined, documented, and put in place, taking into account the nature of the records to be protected. <clears throat> and again, those are the legislative references that this comes from. Now, I, I don't want to go through all of it, although if you have not read it, I would strongly encourage you to read it in detail. But if we could skim down a little further, you can see that I have highlighted another section in red that I'd like to speak to. And that is using the access matrix. The matrix uh, defined here is a sample and the critical steps are the following, that you should define the roles at your board. That step in itself is a large undertaking, defining the roles in your board. I can honestly say that we haven't got all that worked out in our board yet, but it is, we have an understanding of it and realize the complexity. There are large groupings that you'll be able to uh, get, think, get to in a hurry and others that will be more subtle and take time to discern. Two, to customize an inventory of the information or data elements that is accessed by the roles that have been defined. And there they say the following factors were considered in building each matrix and the legislation includes the Education Act, MFIPA, FIPA and CFSA. You'll also find in the matrix examples that I'm going to show you a little later that we have taken into account a level of access, whether the person has access at a board level, a school level, the entire system, or a particular department. Um, each authority will need to decide its own level of access for personal information groups as follows that include student, employee, the number of subgroups, uh, subgroups such as specialized elementary teacher may include French, music, art, phys ed, and so on in a single school. You get the idea. I'm going to skip to the next bullet. The roles, tasks, and or functions identified in the matrices relate only to access personal information. And at times, I must admit, I, I forgot that myself when we went through our initial roll through. And I'll show you what I mean a little later. The access and control matrices include 
included outline the major roles within each school board authority and typical data elements. Each matrix can be used as is or can be modified to suit a particular school board authority. School board authorities should define their own information types, data elements, as well as the titles of their actual roles, tasks, and functions. How do you actually fill in this access matrix? It's highly rec recommended that multidisciplinary teams within your school board authority complete this matrix to ensure the broadest insight into unique roles and data needs are identified. That's an important point in itself. I'm sure all of you have your own privacy information uh, committees back at your board and thinking through who should be represented on that committee is important as well and what subcommittees should be formed. And I think that's what they're trying to um, indicate here. As an example, teams could be broken down into an academic team to examine the roles and data inventory requirements for the academic section. And an administrative review team could examine the administrative and business roles and data inventory requirements for the administrative section. How one chooses to select and segment the teams is up to the individual school board authorities to decide. Completing the matrix is a two-stage process. The first stage identifies the data and access needs of the role, and the second stage evaluates the school board authority's abilities to provide the access required based on technology, procedurisms, and practices, the tools and rules. If you scroll down to stage one then in identifying the needs, when completing the matrix, it's important to adopt the perspective of what access is required to perform the duties of each role. For each unique role defined within your school board or authority, assess the needs of the roles to assess, modify the data elements within your defined data categories. During this needs assessment, it will be necessary for you to define the access into two segments. First, assess the type of access, such as no access at all, read-only access, or read-write and modify access. And secondly, to define the level of access to reflect data at the individual student level, class level, school level, board level, or authority level. You may define additional levels of access to include other common working or organizational groups in your school board authority, such as families of schools and so on. So here's an important point that I wanted to mention to all of you. Um, in my first iteration of this, being one of the IT guys at our board, I tend to look at things uh, in light of what's being said on that phrase at the end of the last page. When completing the matrix for the first time, try to avoid the filtering the needs based on the capabilities of tools and rules used by your board. In a minute, I'm going to show you our first attempt at developing this, and that's precisely the angle that we came at because it was the angle that I was kind of pushing because I happen to see things that way. Well, it's precisely what they're saying is not the right way to go about it the first time around. And I'll make that clear to you in a minute. Don't, what they're saying there is don't let your software applications drive this process. Uh, stage two is the alignment and the evaluation of the needs. Once the matrix is completed, you will need to assess your tools and rules to determine how well the current capabilities of your data systems meet the data needs of the other roles now defined. It is unreasonable to expect that the needs requirements will, be, will fully align with your current tools and rules. You should pay attention to areas where the data needs are not supported well within your school board authority. In each of these misaligned areas, you should examine the opportunities within your school board authority to modify A, your tools, or B, your rules. So what they're suggesting is, is when you go in to do this, start with your people and you work your way through to the process where at the end you're examining your tools and rules to match back up with accessibility, not the other way around. So I think those are the highlighted areas I had, the main important ones, are, not that it isn't all important, but that was the main ones I wanted to show you because that was some of the areas we stumbled with in the early going for our board. So if you would kindly flip over, I'd be delighted to show you our first attempt in the Lambton Kent District School Board to build the access matrix. So here we are, you can see that, and by the way, this was for the IT department, near and dear to me, uh, positions that I felt most comfortable with. So we started building an access matrix for positions within the information technology department. You'll notice in, at the top, we have a legend that indicates B for board level access, or S for school level access, or D for department level access, C is uh, classroom level access, and I is an individual 
uh, access to information. There's also a column that we have that talks about the type of access, which would be NA, that you should not have any access at all, or RO in our case, meaning read-only access, or we have another one, RW, which is read or write access to, uh, to that information. So this was our first attempt, and, and you can see that um, the first position that we wanted to define was the manager's role. Over to the right in the next series of columns is the supervisor of system applications, and then if you could picture this matrix going on and on to the right, we would have in the IT department 25 people in our board, so that, that would extend over 25 or so, not entirely because there are some groups, groupings that we could create, but it's a fairly large matrix just for the IT department alone. And if you think about it then, when you imagine, hey, your, your school board has, I'm sure, thousands of employees, this matrix is going, matrix, matrix that will be huge before you get done. At any rate, let me get back to what I was showing you earlier. So for the manager, you can see that I have some broad categories employee personal information. Sandra, if you wouldn't mind, we'll scroll down a little bit. And you'll find that I had another broad group under this position role, access to students' personal information. And then I had a category here, which now I'm not so sure I should have, we should have had at all, which was board and system confidential information. And Sandra, if you would be so kind as to scroll back up. What I did at that point, or what our committee did at that point on the first kick of the cat of this thing is we listed all the tools that I would have, the manager being me, the tools that I have at my disposal to get at information that I have the right to get at. So you can see I was looking through the spyglass, the telescope, I guess the other way around on the first kick of the cat. Okay, I admit that right up front. See, I told you. Um, anyway, for us, <clears throat> things like our HR system and our financial system, our long-term records retention system, our email system, and so on, I had listed all of them. And then next to that, I hope you can see the column that says the type of access where I have indicated read-only. So for me, there, was op there are occasions when I might require read-only access to our human resources information. Along the way, you'll see there where I have one that's uh, RW, that is our staff performance appraisal uh, software where it would be appropriate for me to have read-write access. And you can see the next column is the level of access and the rationale for why I should have that. Now, that was the first iteration of our access matrix and we had a meeting of our group where we kicked it around and said, okay, that's a good <coughs> starting point, but that's not the way we'd like to do this. At any rate, fully admitting that the first iteration is not that good, can we go to our second iteration? Our, our manager of HR, who sits on the committee as well, said, hey, great, I'd like to take a kick at this, and I'll do it, start in on building the access matrix for our human resources department. And so you can see what he did is closer to the definition that I showed you from the PIM toolkit in that he thought the best way to do this is go through all of the functionality of his department to take a look at what does the HR department do for the Lambton Kent District School Board and he tried to break down all of those requirements. You'll see that in the leftmost column. So you can see that they have HR requirements, health and safety requirements, recruitment requirements that they must perform and if it's quite extensive. If Sandra can scroll down, they have labor relations, negotiations, legal issues, dispute intervention, the list goes on and on. And they decided that's the starting point. We go from what we have to do and then we'll move over that way. So if I could scroll back up, Sandra, thank you. You'll see that, for instance, under health and safety, there's potential incidents and safety policies and H health and safety meetings and inspections and so on. And then going across, <clears throat> and our human resources department is a fairly large department, you can see that they have put in each uh, of the employees 
And then what they've done is put in the same kinds of read-write or read-only or no access at all that I had started with. They continue to have whether the person should have board, classroom, school, or individual access and a rationale for why they should have that access, but it's now being driven by what the functionality of that department is, which quite frankly, I'm a little more comfortable with. And the thinking is at this point, once he drives his way through, he and his staff in the human resources department drive their way through that matrix, then they'll make a second pass at trying to put the tools and rules on top of it. In other words, what software and so on and processes need to be in place to make sure all this works the way we want it to. The one thing I can tell you with great certainty is that we've come to understand that th this is a major undertaking. This is going to take years and years. There will be no end to the development, I can assure you, of your board's access matrix. So if we roll up our sleeves and get started, what we're hoping is, is that it will become, we, we can make sure that everyone understands the importance and significance of it and that over a period of years, we can make it a, a useful tool to our board.